Good morning and welcome to NeoConnect 2020. NeoConnect is NeoCon's online series of resources, programming, and events designed to connect the community throughout the month of June. I'm Monica DiBartolo, NeoCon's Director of Programming, and I want to thank you for joining us. Today's session is approved for one CEU credit for interior designers and one LU for architects. You can find details on CEU credits at the bottom of your screen. So let's begin. What if the conventional wisdom you've been following is actually blocking your path to innovation? Arbery Center calls it wisdom, which describes outdated and ineffective business standards in a changed world. In this session, Eric Corey Fried will discuss how to drive the wisdom out of your business and in its place, devise an innovation strategy. Eric is an award-winning architect, author, and global speaker. He is the Senior Vice President of Sustainability at Canon Design and leads the healthcare, education, and commercial teams. Previously, he was founding principal of Organic Architect, a visionary design leader in biophilic and regener regenerative design. Has been named one of the 25 best green architecture firms in the U.S., and one of the top 10 most influential green architects, as well as one of Build's American Architecture Top 25. Eric is the author of 11 books, including Green Building and Remodeling for Dummies, and he holds a prestigious LEAD Fellow Award from the U.S. Green Building Council. Please join me in welcoming Eric Corey Freed. I can't hear anybody clapping, but uh, let's assume you're cheering, right? Um, hi, everybody. How are you? Um, I'm sorry we can't all be in person. It is very weird to not for June to come and not to be in Chicago uh, waiting for the elevator at Neocon. Um, that's uh, me, and uh, sorry, sorry about you know my face. And um, but this is um, I think my ten or twelfth time speaking at Neocon. My first time speaking virtually and probably my first time speaking in sweatpants. So it's kind of a new thing for all of us here. If you wanna tweet about this as I go, you can, you can do it with this hashtag and there's my label. Um, but what I'm gonna show you is uh, brand new stuff that I'm still kind of working out. As you heard, I am Director of Sustainability for, for Canon Design and um, Canon Design is, it's an incredible firm uh, named by Fast Company is one of the most innovative companies. We're in the top 15 of all architecture firms worldwide. Um, and we have this great, diverse, fun, talented bunch of geniuses that I get to work with every day. And my job is to lead them towards being more sustainable in all of our projects. Not just some projects, but all of them. And we're scattered all over the country, <laughs> all over North America, really, uh, doing really cool things that I get to play in this beautiful playground that they've given me. So I think what I'm trying to say is kind of a big deal, in case you didn't, now it's a stupid joke. Okay, it's also weird to present to you now, given everything, and I mean everything that's happening, and I get it, and next year we'll be together, and I look forward to that. And I know it's getting to the part where it's a little crazy, and seems to be getting crazier, but we're all designers, I think, as designers, we're all optimists as well, so I know that better days are ahead. So let's get started. Okay, so I, I feel like I can't talk to you about sustainability without talking about something that really deeply affected me in the last year, which is this young girl named Greta. Um, she, uh, she was outraged at the lack of action towards the climate crisis and decided to hold a school strike. She started this when she was 15 years old and she started as a strike of one. This is her in August, 2018. And then just a mere 13 months later, here's 4 million people around the world joining her in this protest. And like you, I watched with amazement. We've had uh, protesters before, we've had activists before. Uh, I've been in sustainability for 30 years, but there was something about this girl at this time that really affected me. And I don't know why. Was it because it's the voice that we needed? Is it because I have a daughter that's not that far from her age? I honestly don't know, but what I do know is that she not only captured my attention, but the attention of a lot of people 
around the world. In September, she presented to the United Nations, and I know that pretty much all of you have probably seen this video shared on social media, but there's something powerful about, I wanna show you just a clip of it. And I like the idea of showing it with all of us together. Uh, and I, I don't know why, I just feel compelled to do so, but I just wanna play you a small snippet of this speech from the UN. This is all wrong. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. Yet, you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. And yet, I'm one of the lucky ones. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. That was the line that got me. All you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. She cut right to the heart of it. And it stung. Later that day, uh, President Trump visited the UN, and a camera caught Greta's face as he walked in the room. And being a child, uh, you can see every emotion on her face, right? She's, she, she hasn't learned how to hide her feelings the way the rest of us have. And maybe that's why it's so compelling. President Trump being the person he is, of course, couldn't let it go. And so he had to put this very sarcastic tweet. Oh, she seems like a very happy young girl looking forward to a bright and wonderful future. So nice to see. And Greta, being the human that she is, made it her Twitter avatar, which I thought was just the perfect way to deal with, you know, a bully, really. And so there's something about this girl, this time in our lives, that makes it feel like this is the time we can actually do this. For 30 years, I've been an environmentalist. And for 30 years, I've always felt, well, in five years, everything will be different. And it hasn't been. And now I, I think it, it needs to be. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is innovation but innovation as a strategy to implement sustainability, deep, robust sustainability. This is what I'm leading Canon Design through. I'm leading them through not a sustainability strategy. They already had one before I came aboard. I'm leading them through an innovation strategy. That's the difference. Because it turns out that if you plan for cars and sprawl and traffic, you get cars and sprawls and traffic. But if you plan for community and vibrancy and equity, guess what you get? And the only way to get there is not more of the same thinking. The only way to get there is innovation. And innovation is a word that we are scared to say. Sometimes clients think innovation sounds expensive. Sometimes they think it sounds difficult. But there are companies that you've known for your whole lives that have been known around innovation. That at one time or another, they were the leaders in innovation in their market. Companies, some of which stopped innovating, <laughs> and then got complacent, and then failed to continue, and went by the wayside. There are devices that we've had in our lives that I remember holding and touching and loving for their innovation, and then for some reason, the companies failed to continue innovating. So innovation is not just a strategy you do once, it's something you have to keep doing. And probably the company that's best at it is Apple. They've become synonymous with innovation. But part of being innovative is also knowing when to move on to the next thing, to let go of the past. In 2017, they had two products, an iPod Shuffle and an iPod Nano. They were at the top of their market. They were selling million, millions of units a quarter. At the height of its popularity, Apple discontinued those products, bucking every conventional wisdom in business you can imagine. No other company would take a best-selling product and stop selling it but they came up with something they thought was better, which is the iPod Touch. And they turned out to be right. The history of design, the history of architecture is a history of innovation. In fact, it's a history of technological innovation. The buildings that we admire throughout history are actually innovations in technology. The Egyptians turned stacked stones into pyramids using the latest technology at the time. 2,000 years later, the first post and beam temples, which were made out of wood by the Greeks, they burned and the Greeks said, well, maybe there's something better we can do. So we built them out of marble. And then the marble was considered ugly, by the way, so they painted them bright colors, which normally we don't remember 
it was the height of the technology at the time. And as architecture has grown, so has the technology. Gothic arches and buttresses gave us the ability to span glorious spaces. And then we had bubbles upon bubbles in the Byzantine era. Then the advent of new materials like iron gave us crystal palaces and then eventually skyscrapers. And we kept growing and growing and growing until finally we got to this plasticity. And then we kind of leveled off. Mass production kind of settled into, you know, what we have today. And today's latest innovations are really a little more derivative of where we've been. We've really advanced in fabrication, I think, but not so much in materiality and certainly not in health or in energy use. And so we're kind of stuck. And the way to get out of that is innovation. The way we brainstorm, the way we work in teams, the way we're delivering projects, for the most part, is we're doing it the wrong way. And if you don't believe me, how many of you have been in a meeting where you're like, oh my God, why am I here? <laughs> you're only here out of a sense of duty, right? And so we've created the structure that doesn't invite innovation, doesn't welcome my new ideas, and instead we do things almost on autopilot. And as a result, we end up doing things that are bizarre in hindsight. You have to remember that all the things that now we can look back and th think, well, they seem a little crazy. There was a closely held assumption behind a lot of those wrong decisions. We just hadn't discovered it yet. Um, now, it's not to say that conventional wisdom is bad. There's plenty of conventional wisdom that's good, right? Um, wait an hour after you swim. Never eat uh, an egg salad sandwich from a gas station. Um, if you're going to order a, a, a prostitute, get a receipt. You know, all good advice. <laughs> of conventional wisdom. So you don't just abandon conventional wisdom, but a lot of conventional wisdom is affecting design in a way that is bizarre. If the reason you're cold in your office uh, all the time uh, is, is not because of the thermostat, the reason you're cold in your office is because it was set by standards set for white men six feet tall in the 1950s. And since most of us are not white men six feet tall, <laughs> we're freezing all the time. The reason your kitchen cabinets are too high is because uh, they were based on the height of uh, Swedish ladies from the 1800s, apparently. And uh, apparently the reason your toilet paper is so far from your hotel toilet is, well, I don't know why. I think they're just messing with us, actually. I don't know why they do that. It's just annoying. And all of these bits of conventional wisdom, all of these things that we do automatically in design, are what I label as wisdom. They're things that we do on autopilot. We never question them. And as a result, we've ended up in a place that is not really where we wanted to be. But you have to understand where we are today, an entire generation dependent on fossil fuel-based energy, warming the planet at an alarming rate, having to drive everywhere, and not really having a sense of community in our neighborhoods. That was the plan. This didn't sneak up on us. This was not, uh, we're not victims here. This is what we've wanted. This is 75 years of really bad policy that's got, got us here. Because if you think about buildings, where are they a success? right? Um, in terms of energy, in terms of health, in terms of water, in terms of waste, in terms of our use of resources. Where are buildings really working? We found ways to kind of make them work, but really the only places buildings really work is in terms of providing value for our clients, which is important, but there's a lot of missed opportunities on the table, and I see sustainability as our chance to differentiate ourselves with that, to really lead the pack and do something different. And so what we're fighting is this idea of conventional wisdom, this idea that we're stubborn because things like this are not a good user experience. You know that for years after this is installed, everybody walking in that room is, is this it? Is this it? <laughs> is this it? And so our conventional wisdom gets us doing these things that are weird and then we get sloppy with our work. Then we start losing attention to the details and then the quality of the work suffers. And then we end up doing things that just don't make any sense that are just on autopilot that just become even more wasteful. You see this all the time. You just kind of ignore it. We all do, we've been trained to. But they're weird. I don't know why these stairs are in quotes. Are they not really stairs? Will they not really get us to where we need to go? Is this not really a fire alarm? And then my favorite one is, um, you know, I mean, he is sleeping, so I, maybe the quotes are valid here. That's the trouble with conventional wisdom is that we just do things because we think we're supposed to. And we never stop to question if they should be there or not. And the world is littered with the signage and the evidence of this. 
every time I, I looked around at this airport, I, I expected to see the sign everywhere I went, oddly enough, because it's, I guess it's true. Sometimes conventional wisdom is bizarre. It makes people do really weird things. Sometimes it's wrong all the time. Sometimes it's really wrong, right? And that's certainly true with our buildings. We've been building the same way essentially for the last 200 years. And now we're doing things that we think because we can, we should. But buildings like this should not really probably exist. If anything, it's a testament to our ingenuity. Just through brute force, we can somehow make it work, but not really. And so we're left with buildings that are inefficient and wasteful and hard to manage. And so sustainability is not this thing that we need to tack on. Sustainability is our way out of this. It's our opportunity. We're working with healthcare clients now that they honestly don't know if their buildings are gonna be obsolete in the next three years, given everything that's going on. So we're designing them in new ways to help embrace that flexibility. Take the housing market, for example. We couldn't possibly build enough houses fast enough, quick enough, cheap enough to meet demand. And so that creates an area that's ripe for opportunity. And then take resiliency. Most people don't even have a resiliency plan. We're working with districts and organizations and cities showing them how they need to create one because we can't just count on luck and hope that it'll pass us by. So in sustainability, we've got a lot of problems. And this is the bad news portion of the talk, but I'll, I'll go quickly just to give you a sense of context of where we are. We have 1.6 million people per week being added to our cities every single week. All told, it's about 92 billion square meters that we need to build globally in the next 15 years. It's a huge opportunity, right? But at the same time, we've destroyed the habitat so much that the UN says we only have about 60 harvests left before our food supply will go into decline. The UN also projects that there's going to be about 200 million climate refugees by 2050. And these climate refugees are going to look like you and me. To give you a sense of scale, 200 million was the entire world population at the peak of the Roman Empire. So that's, it's a lot of people. This is my computer fetching the latest climate data. This is from um, just Sunday. You can see carbon levels are over 400 parts per million. They had never been this high in our history. In fact, the last time they were even close to being this high was two million years ago, and there were trees at the South Pole. I know, it's depressing, I know. But um, one of the ways that I deal with it is that I study the data. So I wanna show you kind of the, the hits of the last decade. Normally at the end of a decade, we look at the best music, the best movies. I, uh, I like to look at the climate crisis really. So let's look back at 2010, 2019. The five hottest years on record were the last five years. And in fact, that's just something we're gonna be saying now. 2020 isn't even anywhere near done, but we already can pretty much expect that it's gonna be one of the five hottest years on record. Four of the five largest wildfires in California happened in this decade. We saw six Category 5 hurricanes that tore through the Atlantic region in just the past four years. Arctic sea ice is at an all-time low, dropped about 13% over that decade. And all of our 100-year floods are now five-year floods. And that doesn't mean that every 100 years a flood comes. It means that in any year, you've got a 1% chance of, of that type of flood happening. Now it's a 20% chance. In addition, we had more than $100 billion climate disasters in that same period, double from the decade before. And in that decade, we pumped about 40.5 billion tons of CO2 into the air, also a new record. So we're well on track to warming at above three degrees centigrade, which is really means the earth is gonna be very different than what it is now. And when my daughter is my age, she's gonna be facing a world that is totally different. And I know that it's good to be optimistic, but it turns out that we've been optimistic too much. All of our climate models were eagerly awaiting change. And I think one of the biggest changes that I've had just in this last decade is that I'm no longer as optimistic as I usually am. I, I'm, I'm really treating it almost like a triage situation. This idea that people are gonna become profoundly better and uh, rise up and do something about the climate crisis, I think I've kind of let that idea go because it turns out most people are terrible. I don't know if you've been paying attention, but most people are, uh, kind of involved with themselves, especially celebrities, and kind of involved with themselves. So I don't know if we're just going to magically become better people and have a better planet. Uh, we're going to have to say the planet is terrible as we are right now. And this is not an abstract thing in the distance. We have to do this now. We, there is no time here. We need to change, and we need to change quickly. And that requires innovation. 
you know, I, as an environmentalist, I do all the things that I imagine a lot of you do. I drive an electric car. My house is powered by renewable energy. Uh, you know, we, we don't eat meat anymore. We, we still eat chicken. But, uh, you know, when I go to the store, I bring my bags. And, you know, we offset our flights, all that other business. And I have to tell you, after doing all of this stuff, it's um, really annoying. It's really a pain, actually. <laughs> it's it's, it's uh, a way to try to control, uh, you know, a system that wasn't really designed to be improved. And it kind of makes you think maybe we should just rethink the whole process. Uh, being an environmentalist is annoying. I believe me, I annoy myself. Sometimes I want to punch myself in the face. I get it. So what we need is change, but people are afraid of change. For most people, they think change looks like this. And, and I mean, it can, I guess, if you wanted to, but it doesn't, it doesn't have to. I've decided that it's not, um, it's not people that are paying attention to climate science and people that are ignorant of it. I, I think that's too reductionist. I think it's more that you have people that are scared of the science, like me, and then you have people that are scared of the change that the science kind of forebodes. And both are pretty reasonable things to think about. And I think maybe that's part of how we could address this in a new way. You have to understand that we are not wired to innovate. Our brains are not wired that way. Our brains are wired to protect us, literally. Our hunter-gatherer brains are really designed to help us avoid things that are scary or difficult. They're really just trying to keep us alive. So you're not wired to innovate. So knowing all that, knowing that we, our brains are not wired to do this, yet we have to, how do we innovate our way to a zero-carbon future that we know we need to? Knowing that our brains are telling you all the time, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. I was reading this uh, book. This has nothing to do with sustainability. It's just an interesting book about history. And it's called The Essence of Decision. And it's really about the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. And it turns out, uh, the author argued, that when the leaders uh, really decided on a course of action, they weren't really trying to innovate. Instead, they were really trying to just get approval. And I think we all kind of do that a little bit. But there's examples in, uh, throughout history where we can do that better. So for example, Sir Christopher Wren, the famous architect of London's St. Paul Cathedral, one day, uh, the story goes, he was touring the site during construction, and he came upon three stone masons. And he said to one of them, what are you doing? And one said, well, I'm cutting stone. I'm not going to do the accent. And then he came to another one, and he said, what are you doing? And he said, uh, I'm earning a wage. And then he came to the third person, and he said, well, what about you? What are you doing? And he said, I, sir, I am building a great cathedral. Now they're all doing the same thing, but one's really understanding the context of the innovation at the time. And it really reminds us that you have to choose to be innovative. It won't happen to you accidentally. You have to choose to make that happen. For example, something like this. Imagine modifying the DNA code of plants to grow living buildings. We can revolutionize construction, architecture, and gardening, creating entire cities out of living organic material. Now that seems exciting, right? That seems kind of interesting. But to get there, to get to that future, we have to innovate. And our current conventional wisdom and the way we design is going to hold us back, is going to keep us from doing that. So we need to look for opportunities to do this. And it turns out that the level of conformity in any organization is really an inverse proportion to its ability to be creative. So for example, we're all designers. Clients come in and they want us to design something. And oftentimes they'll say, we want you to design a better wheel. But we fail to ever stop, step back and question, well, do we even need wheels? Is there a better way? We do this all the time in buildings. We come in and we assume the building's going to have drywall or air conditioning or we're going to flush clean drinking water down the toilet. And in truth, we could kind of step back and say, well, are there opportunities to not do that? Are there opportunities to reduce the embodied carbon of this building and the operational carbon of this building such that we could get to zero? And it really starts by questioning some of these baseline assumptions that normally go unspoken. And that's very hard for people to do. It's very hard to ask people to like sit in a meeting and speak up and offer innovation. It's terrifying, actually, and I get that. So I want to give you a little piece of advice. The next time you have an idea and you think, well, surely somebody's going to say this. I don't need to be the one to say it. I, I don't want to bring it up. I don't want to look foolish. Just remember, the next time you have an idea and you're worried about looking foolish, remember that at some point, somewhere, at some time, somebody said, hey, you know what we should do? We should make a film with tornadoes full of sharks. And they did. They made that. So 
I like to think about that every time I think oh, I should mention this, and then I do. So do that. Keep it in your head. It'll really, trust me, it'll, it'll help. Sometimes innovations come when you're not expecting them or maybe even not uh, wanting them, really. Sometimes the innovations are weird, but they're different for different sake. And sometimes the innovations are made to look like accidents, but they're not really. And sometimes innovations come exactly when you want them and need them and then bring you this glorious thing. Um, when I was doing my rehearsal, um, Monica, I, she, this is the truth. She goes, oh my God, that looks good. And yeah, it really does. And then I, at the last talk I was at live in person, it was in Madison, Wisconsin in March, I think. And I showed this to the audience and they got so excited, they immediately ran out and bought them and then texted me this picture showing me. So um, hopefully when the lockdown goes, you can go to KFC and get it. Okay, so, so let's say you're a sustainability director in a large design firm. Do you create a bunch of policies and a bunch of flaming hoops and a bunch of annoying data collection systems that people have to jump through and will do so begrudgingly? Or do you give them the opportunity to innovate? And that's really how I see the choice. For most firms, they see sustainability as this thing over there. They park sustainability in their marketing department, not in their design department. And every major firm has a sustainability as this outside thing. If you come in asking for sustainability, they definitely absolutely will provide it. Um, and they all have web pages that tell you the same thing. But it's a model that I call the if the client asks for it approach. If the client asks for a lead building, we'll give them a lead building. If the client asks for net zero, we'll give them that too. But it's really kind of missing the opportunity because it's really following this model of the same old thinking and somehow producing different results. And that's not how it works. The design is really about constraints. It's about embracing our limitations and really making the most of them. And what better constraints or limitations are there than sustainability, a building, a building that is super energy efficient, that's uh, super healthy. And ultimately, at the end of the day, our deliverable are not drawings. Our deliverable is thinking about those drawings, thinking about that design. And if thinking is our deliverable, shouldn't innovation be a key strategy in that? But this is not me saying this. This is what our clients are demanding. Look at the recent trends. 130 banks with 47 trillion in assets, including Deutsche Bank, Citigroup, and Barclays, have adopted all these new UN-backed climate policies that are radically going to shift their loan books away from fossil fuels. So if you're in the fossil fuel industry, you probably won't be able to get funding. New York City itself has set ambitious targets for all of its buildings because it's the largest emitter of all. And now we've set our sights on concrete because it's embodied carbon, it's upfront carbon is so heavy, we can't afford to just keep using it. It's being called the most destructive material on earth. And now we're realizing that steel and aluminum are kind of there too. So not only should we give up concrete, we should also look at the upfront carbon of steel at the same time, which opens up huge opportunities for us in mass timber, which is the only real scalable zero carbon technology that we have that has a code pathway that we can use. So we're really going all in on mass timber. And even when we have a president that's talking about coal, which is his right to do, U.S. renewable investments hit a record last year. So it's not really tied to the market anymore. We saw Europe's biggest emitter of carbon dioxide, RWE, they pledged to be carbon neutral by just 2040. That was kind of huge news. And at the same time, the governor of the Bank of England said that any companies or industries that are not moving towards zero carbon are eventually going to go bankrupt and probably deserve to be. In fact, Moody's, the uh, credit rating agency that we all know and trust, right? They bought a climate data firm. And they said that any city that's not addressing climate and carbon policy is going to risk a downgrade. I was in a meeting recently, and I won't say who, but the, it's a, a great client. And um, they had said, well, you know, our goal is to uh, have this carbon reduction, you know, 80% carbon reduction by 2020. And there was just kind of this silence in the room. And I said, um, you know, it's June 2020, right? <laughs> 2020, like 2020 is here. And they all just kind of laughed. And, oh, my God, you're right. Yeah. Um, we've been saying this bullet point for 10 years now. And I guess, I, guess, um, I guess now it's 2020. So they quickly changed their goal to 2025. And so what we're doing with them is we're saying, okay, if you want to be carbon neutral by 2025, that's, that's really in, what, 42 months. So let's make a plan for those 42 months to help get you there because hoping for it or setting some arbitrary date isn't going to cut it. Um, part of the trouble is sustainability is hard to define. For instance, um, 
when you go to the grocery store, you're faced with a conundrum, right? Do you want paper or plastic? And you think, well, aren't they both bad? Plastic's made of oil and paper's made from trees and we want to keep trees. And you're kind of confused. And in the middle of all that, then they say, well, do you want a, you want a reusable bag? And then you're really even more confused. The messaging on sustainability has granted been terrible. I, I admit it. But even with things around health, right? When I was growing up, I was told an apple a day keeps the doctor away. But at the same time, I was told, well, eat the skin because it's good for the fiber, but the skin has all the pesticides, so don't eat the skin, but do eat the skin, but don't. Okay. I've been told by several different doctors that I need to eat more tuna to get my omega-3s, but at the same time, don't eat tuna because it's full of mercury. <laughs> it's confusing. You need to be a PhD almost to keep up with this full time. And as a result, you don't know what to believe. Everything that was supposed to be good for us is bad for us. Everything when I was growing up has changed, right? When I was growing up, I was told that we need more red meat, milk, college. All that was supposed to be good for us, and it's bad for us. <laughs> and don't even get me started on almond milk, because I'm, I, I don't even know what to do anymore. This is why the messaging on the climate crisis has been so messy, because we ourselves don't understand it. This is the cover of Maclean's. This is the Canadian Time magazine, essentially. And you can see that they're kind of suffering from this too. This is the reason why we were able to ban drinking straws, but not assault weapons. Because drinking straws are bad was a clear message that we could convey to people, and I guess that's why we did it. Now, I also know that helium balloons are bad, but I certainly don't want to be the one to ban them because they make me happy. All right, so the process is imperfect, and I don't think it's ever going to be. But let's embrace that imperfection. These are the tools that we use in an innovation strategy. We solicit ideas. We welcome feedback. And if we do it right, we have fun doing it. And then we put into action how we implement those ideas. Because it's not about the ideas. You're all great at ideas. You could come up with ideas all day long. That's, what you're, that's your job. So it's not about the ideas. It's about implementing those ideas and making them happen. So for innovation to happen, it really requires a few things. First, it needs faster communication and ways to measure the efficacy of that communication. It needs faster feedback loops from staff and actually building out those feedback loops and requires a big vision for what that change is supposed to be. At my firm, our vision is every building a green building by our definition of green, which means net zero energy, half slash embodied carbon by half. It's pretty clear. For, in order to do that, the staff requires room to have that innovation. You need to invite them into that. You need to give them time to do that. And ultimately, you need to find a way to reward that. I'm going to give you an example two different stories that are, you know, um, hard to hear. You might remember about three years ago, United Airlines uh, had an overbooked flight and uh, it, it resulted in a passenger being bloodied and beaten and dragged off the plane. And since everybody's got cell phones, we recorded this and it made national news. The uh, then CEO, Oscar Munoz, issued a statement which at one point called uh, the 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 passenger here disruptive and belligerent and kind of made things worse. And their market value lost a billion dollars in a week. How could a normal operation procedure on a flight lead to a passenger getting beaten and bloodied and dragged off the plane? It doesn't make sense. And when asked, everybody said, well, this was our policy. But that couldn't have been the policy, right? It was the interpretation of that policy. Contrast that with almost exactly a year later. Southwest Airlines had a flight where a piece of engine broke off and hit a window and the window blew out and a passenger was unfortunately sucked partially out of the plane. The other passengers rallied behind her and held onto her as they made an emergency landing. And unfortunately she died. Southwest didn't try to spin it. They didn't try to control their stock price. Their employees just burst into action. There were 144 passengers on that flight and 144 Southwest Airlines employees showed up and each grabbed one passenger. And they said to them, I am your point of contact. If you need anything, I will get it for you. If you're hungry, I'll get you food. If you're thirsty, I'll get you a drink. If you need therapy, I'll get you that too. But I'm only taking care of you and nobody else. They didn't worry about shareholder price. They didn't worry about the cost of it all. They knew something fundamental. It was deep in their DNA. We love our customers. And it was apparent in every way they handled that situation. A tra tragic situation that wasn't made worse by the fumblings of a, you know, a stupid corporate policy. That's what it means to lead with empathy. And I think ultimately that's our job as designers. That's, and it can, and that's what
do it. We call it leading center design. And this is not a plug. I mean, it's literally, we're fighting every day to find more ways to do this, to lead with empathy. Because how can you look at this and think that this is separate from us as designers and architects? It's not. So now, how do you lead with empathy? How do you imagine what could be? You do it through innovation. And so we run through these innovation strategies with our clients and ask these really kind of crazy questions. What if a building could actually make you feel things? And I don't mean emotionally, I mean literally make you feel things. What if a building could trigger serotonin to make you feel calm or trigger your brain chemistry's endorphins to help you feel healthier or oxytocin to make you feel welcome or dopamine to help you feel motivated? Couldn't we play with our brain chemistry at a fundamental cellular level and make us feel things in the building just by doing the right things? So we're going all in on that. We're also looking at technologies like 3D printing and how to use it in an innovative way. We're looking at things like prefabrication and using that in an innovative way to achieve these sustainability outcomes. We're looking at automation in new ways because this is inevitable for our industry and how to do that. And eventually this will become a normal part of our design process. In fact, maybe this is what our, our sites will look like. And just as I had made this, I, I don't know if you've been watching Westworld, but they basically had the same thing on Westworld on HBO. And if you haven't seen it, it's, it's really good. Okay, so we're using parametric modeling to achieve sustainability. This is um, from Fitch, this is, not, this is not our stuff, but they're using parametric modeling to automatically do furniture arrangements now. So in five years, imagine what will be possible. And we're trying to do this with parametric modeling for sun and solar control and daylighting. And all of this is leading us to this big vision, which is what I call our new focus, which is a radical focus on efficiency, radical fo focus on sufficiency, radical focus on simplicity, radical electrification, let's stop burning things in buildings, radical decarbonization, and ultimately radical restoration, let's clean up the mess that we've created from the last century. And if we do these six things properly, ultimately there's a seventh, which is radical community. And if you do the first six right, it opens up opportunities for that. So how would that even work? So what I wanna show you, and this is kind of the, the end bit here, but I wanna show you these kind of eight rules, what I call our innovation agreements, our eight agreements around innovation. And I'm giving them to you, and, and I'd love to hear your feedback and thoughts on them. If, if you think that there's more that I need to add or change, I'd love to hear that too. But I'm gonna go through what, what I've been using so far just because I've been struggling with this and now, now I guess you get to. First, the first innovation agreement is you can't change a system that refuses to change. You, remember I said that you need to um, choose innovation? So that's part of it, you need to choose innovation. And ultimately you have to make the staff empowered to feel that they have the authority to talk about innovation. And most staff do not. And I find a large part of my job is constantly reminding them that I need your innovative ideas. Number two is, um, you should all set a moonshot for whatever it is you're doing. If we're designing a hospital, if we're designing a high school, if we're designing a university building, what would the moonshot look like? Maybe if we're designing a university building, that would be the healthiest building on campus. Then it's good to daydream about that. What would building the healthiest building on campus mean? What would it mean to the students? What would it mean to the staff? What would it mean to the campus? And what would that look like? How would that change our approach? And if we galvanize them around this big moonshot, suddenly it's not about chasing lead points, but rather about chasing a vision. Knowing the end game is really part of the process, which leads us to number three. Take complex ideas in sustainability, which is very muddled, I know, and make them simple by just leading with benefit. Don't talk about all the lead credits and how you're gonna get all these lead credits. That's the, that's the, that's the how. Focus on the why. Why do we do these things? What are the benefits that it produces? We make a building that's better, that has um, higher test scores for students, higher patient recovery outcomes, uh, lower operation costs. Those are the things that get people excited. Which leads us to number four, focus on the why before you focus on the how. I think as, you know, as designers, we love to get technical very quickly. We love to dive in deep and really jump into the how right away. And that makes sense, but our clients don't necessarily need to follow us along on that how journey. You don't go to a client and say, hey, we're gonna use Revit on this project. They don't care, they don't care. That's your how. Yeah, we're gonna use Revit with these plugins. It's gonna be great. And that, that's not how we talk about it. We're gonna talk about the benefit it's gonna bring. We're gonna design this beautiful place for you. And I think we need to do the same thing with sustainability. And if you can do that, you'll start to skip a lot of landmines that you're setting for yourself. 
right? If you start making it about the, the how, chasing the points, you're going to end up focusing on value engineering them all the time, which leads us to number five. Avoid the trap of language by coming up with new words. I love coming up with new words. It's great because then we don't fall into those biases and patterns that we normally do. So I don't call it value engineering. We call it valued engineering. How do we make longer term decisions using life cycle costing so that way we're not really painting ourselves into a corner? And if you start to invent these new words and invite everybody else in the team to do this, uh, it really boosts creativity. Sometimes the words can be gibberish too. Sometimes, sometimes in meetings we'll say, we're gonna have some sort of dangly thingy over here that's gonna block the sun. And dangly thingy kind of works well. So you, know, you don't have to be um, Shakespeare here. You can kind of make it up as you go. Which leads us to number six. When you're looking at an innovation strategy, it can't just be about the big vision all the time. You also have to find some short-term wins in there too. And you kind of have to balance that back and forth. So you're doing short-term things that help the team solve a problem and longer-term things that set a vision and going back and forth constantly. And in doing that, you're really starting to make it count, which leads us to number seven. Um, just because something's broken doesn't mean it needs to be thrown away. Don't innovate for innovation's sake. Sometimes the reason they're broken is because it's not understood or not implemented or not managed right. But the basic idea was sound. So again, it's about questioning things. So I know there's this tendency to wipe the slate, but in doing so, maybe you can just kind of fix the thing that's keeping it from being a success. Which leads to number eight. You got to plan to build it twice. When Steve Jobs wanted to do an Apple store, they did in complete design with a complete full-size mock-up in a warehouse. And he looked at it and said, you got to do it again. That's kind of part of the plan. We prototype, we design, we iterate. And with sustainability and using an innovation strategy to get there, we kind of have to build a plan at least twice. Build it, reassess, reevaluate, change the plan. Repeat if necessary, on and on and on. And the reason I say this is because if you know this going in, it won't seem so daunting. If you plan for that in your schedules, in your budgets, in your enthusiasm, it will help. Part of the things that are gonna get in your way for innovating are biases, and there's lots of biases. Um, and I've talked about biases in different forms before. One of the biases we see all the time is that most people think green buildings look like this, for example. And um, maybe they do, <laughs> but they don't have to. And sometimes biases are a good thing. They help us make quicker decisions. They, um, they help us uh, move things faster, but sometimes our biases get in the way. So I'm gonna play a little game with you, a little word scramble here. And uh, it'd be more fun if we were all in the same room, but it can't be. So what do you guys think the first word is? And you can put it in the chat. A little word scramble. And, um, and it's, a, it's a part of the human body. Let's just say that. What do you think the first word is? I'll give it to you. It's a spine, of course. What did you think it was? <laughs> Kate, Christina, Allie. Yeah, they all got it. Good for you. What about the second one? What do you think that is? Subtext. And, it, and by the way, if you thought it was anything else, that's your bias on display, and there's nothing wrong with that. But it kind of shows us how our brain starts to see patterns that might not be there. In fact, our brain is good at seeing patterns for things and helping us cope all the time. Remember, our brains are ultimately trying to save us. They're trying to help us, and sometimes they get in the way of innovation. So one little tip I want to give to you is don't sell people on sustainability. You can sell your staff, your team. Uh, but ultimately, if you're waiting for clients to come in and ask for sustainability, it's not going to happen. But if you sell them on outcome, that'll get them very excited. And when you start to work with that type of potential, problems start to drip away. So these are the outcomes that I typically start with. You're welcome to them. You're welcome to add to them. There's more, of course. But these are the 10 that I usually use. And I change them up if I'm working on a hospital or a school or, or an office, right? But, but generally, this is it. And the, beauty, the beautiful part is, is that sustainability is our pathway to achieving these outcomes. So early on in the design phase, in fact, sometimes before in the pursuit phase, we're selling clients on these outcomes and getting them excited about these outcomes. And in doing so, they get baked into the design. The whole team is excited about them. The client's excited about them. They don't get valued engineered out because it's, re it's really about achieving that, that vision. But the trouble is that um, you know what a client's favorite word is, right? The client's favorite word is no. That's every client's favorite word, and I get it. In fact, sometimes their favorite word. No, 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 no. It's like that. You get it. 
So if you know that the client's favorite word is no, let's stop asking them yes questions. If you know the client's favorite word is no, don't go in and say, hey, do you want lead? Because then they'll go, no, which is, I guess, what we expected. So instead, we reframe that question. And we say, do you want to keep paying $40,000 a month for electricity? Because that's what you're doing now. And when they go, well, no, okay, then we're going to do a net zero energy building. Fine. Reframe every argument to focus on these outcomes. Do you want lead? No. Do you want a green roof? No. <laughs> do you want solar? No. Hey, do you want to keep having employee sick days? Because you're paying a lot of money for that. No. Okay. Then we're going to do a healthy material strategy throughout the whole building. It suddenly opens up and invites possibility. And what you're really doing is you're just blowing it right back in their face, which is a good thing. And I know that, um, you know, that makes people upset. Um, but if a client pushes back a little bit and says, well, how do you know it'll work? All you have to do is say, well, how many green buildings have you worked on? And typically clients like that will say, well, none. Okay, well then let's try it. <laughs> they're fearful of their inexperience and they're looking to you for guidance. And so this is where our guidance really chimes in. And I know doing this can sometimes make clients upset, but that's okay because we're selling them on this bigger vision. This idea that we're not going to do something because of some fear of some potential thing that might go wrong, but doesn't seem likely, I call that phenomenon front lash. It's the opposite of backlash. We're not going to do something because of something that might happen, but we're just not going to do it at all and even see. It's front lash. I don't know what else to call it, so we call it front lash. I get it. Green is confusing. Sustainability is weird. But it is, as you're already seeing, a vital part of what we're doing. So the last thing I'm going to leave you with, and then we're good for time, is five strategies for how to innovate right now. And um, this will at least get you started. First, really take hold of the agenda. Every meeting, every interaction we have with the client is our opportunity to sell them on these outcomes. So when you're having even your kickoff meeting with them, take control of the agenda. Invite the right people in the room. Get the operations people and the capital people in the room together. Because when the capital people hear how much they're spending on steam every month, suddenly they're going to be open to changing their systems and really push for face-to-face -face interactions. If anything, this coronavirus showed us the beauty of having face-to-face -face video calls. I don't have phone calls anymore. Every phone call is a face-to-face -face video, I imagine, like you're having. And it's really changed the game because 90% of our communication is nonverbal. Number two, really define success. Think of what your moonshot would be for that project. What if this was the healthiest building on campus? What if this was the greenest hospital in the district? Um, what if it was the first hospital to have a community nutrition program? Think of that moonshot that would get your clients excited and it'll galvanize their efforts and rally everybody around it. Number three, really push back on the program, whatever they give you. If they give you a basis of design, an OPR, a formal program, whatever it is, I'm of the mindset now that it's our duty to push back a little bit. Because again, there's so much conventional wisdom baked in there, these assumptions and boilerplate that were never really questioned, that oftentimes they don't know the reason why. We see this all the time when clients come and ask you for lead silver. Well, why do you want lead silver? I don't know. We we're told we're, we're supposed to. Okay, well, what do you like about lead? What are you interested in sustainable? Let's get them excited about it and focus on the outcome rather than on the checklist. And then again, it won't get valued engineered out. Number four, you need to empower everybody on the team. And I mean everybody. Every project should ultimately be an integrated project delivery method in order to achieve things like net zero energy. And so you need to empower everybody to speak up and see, you know, to be able to innovate wherever they can. Project managers through draft people through everybody and constantly remind them that that's part of their role too. And it'll get them more engaged and excited. And then lastly, you got to keep pushing. It's not enough to bake in the outcomes at pursuit or in design. You got to push through DD and CDs and CA and ultimately post occupancy too. And we're doing it not to be annoying. <laughs> we're doing it because ultimately we want to make better projects because we're leading with empathy. And finally, the last thing I want to leave you with is this three questions that um, we're not going to be able to workshop here today, but three questions that I'm just going to give you as, as ways to start the conversation with your clients. Uh, so ask these among your staff internally. The first one is what are the metrics you think your clients would most love to measure? And it might be things that they're already measuring but not putting it to use or most likely that they're not measuring at all. Number two, what is the data that you'd most want to measure on a completed project? And you'll find that it's different than what your client wants to measure. And then number three, 
what's the one new service you'd want to offer to your clients? The answers to those questions from your staff will be enlightening and will get you started. That being said, that's the end of my time. I, uh, I wish we could all be in person celebrating at the Merchandise Mart, but we can't. So uh, thank you for coming. If you want more information, text the word green to this number. This is not my phone number, by the way. So if you wanted to send me a, a you know, weird message, I, I won't get it. But you can text the word green to that number and you'll get uh, the slides. And, uh, and then I'll email you a follow-up. Uh, if you don't have a cell phone, for whatever reason, you can just follow that link too and get the slides. Otherwise, that's my talk. That's my time. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope to see you all soon. Stay safe. Keep your heads about you. Be well. Oh, I have questions. Okay, let's see. Monica says I have questions. Uh... Let's see. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing the questions in the chat. I'm just seeing chat and people using the word spine and subtext. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Oh, you broke up there. Could you repeat that? What is your opinion of PLE and how receptive are your clients? How will that be changed post COVID? Uh, I think the question, you're, you're very muddled, Monica, but I think the question is about POE, post occupancy evaluations. Yes. And, um, and I, Oh, here we go. I, I love uh, post-occupancy evaluations and the challenge that everybody has, and I'm sure you all do too, is how do we pay for them? And so this, is, this was the thing that I started pushing at Canon right away. And of course, everybody's like, yeah, we, we want to do that. Uh, no, duh, basically was the response that I got. But how do we do them? And so we're tr trying multiple strategies. Strategy number one is a lot of our clients are repeat clients. And so we're, we're going back to the project anyway for other things. So we're incorporating a robust POE strategy into, we know we're going back anyway for this, so while we're there, let's track and measure this. Um, we're trying to do more than just send out surveys for post-occupancy evaluation, and instead really um, observe. The second thing we're doing is, since we're baking in these outcomes and setting this big goal, especially this is gonna be the first net zero, whatever, this is gonna be the healthiest, whatever, um, it kind of gives us ample excuse to go back to the client and feed information uh, you know, get, gather information around tracking towards that goal. And um, we're hoping to streamline the data so it just kind of comes into a spreadsheet and doesn't require a lot of staff time. And so it's about kind of building an automated feedback loop. And, and um, without getting too nerdy, we're using, honestly, we're using um, Microsoft's Power BI as one way to track this. We're using Google Docs to do surveys and make instant charts and graphs. We have um, two very nerdy PhDs on staff that do this really well. And, um, but we're still trying to figure that out too. And, uh, and then the last thing we're doing is we're, we're baking in POEs as part of the scope early on so the client can see that, that we are getting paid for it. Um, uh, let's see, Craig said, an issue so often is so many influencers around the client convince them they cannot afford it. Sustainability is too expensive. Um, yeah, that's where life cycle costing comes in. Um, a lot of things are expensive in a project. Buildings are expensive, so let's just price everything and let's really figure out the true ROI because, you know, buying a cheaper system that's going to cost them more in the long run suddenly doesn't seem like a wise decision. Also, you'll notice that I talked about bringing in the, the operations people with the capital people in the meetings, so that way, again, we can make informed decisions, so that's a good way around it. Um, how do you sell innovation to clients that don't have the short-term budgets for these long-term solutions? Uh, that's a great question. So it depends on the client. With um, university clients, what we found is that they'll have uh, bonds or approved measures to build certain buildings, and they'll spend $100 to avoid increasing their operation costs by $1. So knowing that their, their avoidance is to kind of move money off the books into capital improvements and away from operations suddenly sets up opportunities for things around solar, right? Um, 
hey, your energy bill is going to go down. Are you interested in solar? And so we're really just trying to figure out their pain points. So short-term budgets are a really a great way to figure out, well, what are you struggling with? And normally keeping operation costs low, you know, really maximizing the budget of capital campaigns in that gray space becomes an opportunity for sustainability. In addition, there's lots of things that we're going after, such as health, that don't have an ROI per se, and we're giving them the data and the resources and the white papers to show them that it does, even, even though they don't think it does. The biggest expense in the building is the people, not the building. So we're showing them how investments in the people pay off rather quickly. Uh, oh, yeah, Craig points out uh, the five initiatives that I talked about, this is all IPD, integrated project delivery, absolutely. Uh, I'm not shy about that. I think every project should be an integrated project delivery project. I don't know about your firm, but at ours, more than half of our projects are either a P3 project or a design build. I think it's the way of the industry and that's going to keep going. And so the more integrated we can be, the better. And so having the contractor on board at the beginning is an amazing opportunity for sustainability. Um, can I put the telephone number back up? Yes, sorry. Here you go. Okay. Um, Lee Kaplan talks about wiring Cat6 cables rather than aluminum or copper. Yeah, and there's a, there are there are companies. Um, uh, Superior Essex, for example, has a has a cables like that that are less embodied energy. If you want to check them out. And uh, that looks like it's it for the questions. If there are other questions, let me know. Otherwise, you can email me or text me at this number. Text the word green to that number, and, you'll, and I'll email you right away. Otherwise, I think we're almost at the end here. And I'll, by the way, uh, I'll share all the slides with all of you so you, so you have them. And, and this has been recorded, so you can, you can watch it again. Eric, thank you for that. Thought. Well, any 